Okay, we are live on What Does the Bible Say? I'm your host, Johnny Robertson, tonight, and we are here in Martinsville, Virginia, as far as location, and we have information tonight that it is uh, really to the degree we have reached a level in regard to things that are going on in the United States that is... I, I don't know to call it a new all-time low or is it the fact that people are intensified in their thinking to the point where they're now ready to be schooled. And so when I tell you tonight's broadcast is going to be controversial, I can tell you that I have a, I do have a slide here. Let me see where that slide is. Um, And this is it. Now, I want you to know tonight, this is not family TV. So, if you've got your children watching tonight, you don't want them watching. That's just all I know to say. It's one of those shows where we're in the real world. It is 9 o'clock at night. It's grown-up TV time. Normally, um, we know that young people watch our show. We don't make our show for young people. But it just so happens that people all over the United States watch our show, and often families will get together. Like, you know, if you're in Texas, we've just had different family members tell us that we, you know, it's time to put the kids to bed. And when it's Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday, the kids basically tell their parents, but we want to watch What Does the Bible Say? Now, when's the last time anybody listening actually had your kids saying, we want to watch our local preacher? Are our local pastor. And so one of the reasons why is what you just saw fly in. We show over and over and over and over that people are being duped. And so tonight is no different. My cell phone number is 276-806-2150. Get that out there in the very beginning. You see us on YouTube, tell a friend. And so tonight we're going to do a little answering to start off with. We had Sarcastic Man call in last week, I guess it was. I don't think I take the buzz, but Sarcastic Man called in and he, okay, we, do, we did get it. He, he actually told Charles that he would give Charles a book, The Truth About the Church of Christ. Well, we're so happy you brought it up because we've had, I've had this book for 35 years and it's probably, I don't know, the printing is probably... 1979 or something like that. I don't remember exactly what. 1977. And uh, I had my copy for uh, it's 1986 for sure. And it is amazing what you're going to hear in this. But that rattled the um, basic callers, you might say, Joe Prater. And now Joe is just rabid. I don't know what his problem is. He, he just rabid against the truth. And Sarcastic Man, I don't know what his deal is either. He just likes being on TV behind the scenes. You know, I basically talk, talk about these people like they're behind the bleachers. You know, you got somebody that's under the bleachers and they're making cat calls and nobody can see them and they just... But now this gentleman here, um, Eugene Grant, he's out in front because pretty much we have put him out. Uh, a lot of people don't know what he looked like. They just hear this gravelly voice that said he's in the entertainment business and stuff like that. And so he used to be a member of the Church of Christ. And the reason why is he called in one time to tell James Oldfield he was going to have a debate with him. He could answer him on music. And then he ended up knowing that he had made such a mess that he decided, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So I don't know if he really ever saw the truth or not or just wanted to be, you know, under the big tent. That's where he is right there. And so... These are individuals that are your local voices that talk about answering us. And so tonight, we're going to go right down the road with them. And we're going to show a few things that I hope will be useful to you. Now, Hugh Piles is the author of The Truth About the Church of Christ. Now, here's my question. Sword of the Lord is the publishing company. Now, how does that sound? Man, that really sounds like, and I'm going to eventually get on down to Murfreesboro if we ever get cleared up where we can travel and check out the sword of the Lord and see what these folk are like in person because 
they seem, they put it forth that they are the tip of the sword, that they are like the front line Navy SEALs of the Baptist, independent Baptist uh, faith, fundamental, independent fundamental Baptist. And I tell you what, tonight we have video. You might say, I, I didn't know there was video that what does the Bible say and Religious Review wouldn't play. I haven't made up my mind whether it is possible to play this video associated with the Sword of the Lord crowd. One of the reasons that we're in tune right now with the Sword of the Lord, I mean, we've always known about the Sword of the Lord. John R. Rice moved over from Fort Worth, Texas into Greenville, South Carolina. What's the Foy Wallace debate? Frank Norris. Frank, J. 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 Frank Norris, biggest Baptist church in Dallas, Fort Worth area, debated Foy Wallace, and it was just an amazing event. J. Frank Norris, everybody knows that J. Frank Norris shot somebody in his own office, Baptist preacher. John R. Rice was his sidekick. John R. Rice moved over here to South Carolina. And he basically is Tabernacle Baptist is what it was. And in my old uh, version of this book, back of it with you piles there, these guys are uh, like Fred Phelps, the GodHatesFags.com group out of Topeka, Kansas. They're all in there together. They're, you know, Bob Jones University. That's basically Fred Phelps. If you haven't heard of Bob Jones University, you know, Bob Jones is one of the, the last holdouts for mixed marriages. They were basically saying up into the 80s that, that you could not mix in marriage. Black and white could not marry. These folks were super racist, and they are just the most fanatical level and they're right here, Tim Whitehart, Sword of the Lord, his grandfather. We're going to show him tonight preaching over at Walkertown. He's not going to be at Walkertown. He's going to be in Hammond, Indiana. But he was over at Walkertown, uh, North Carolina, and that he is like a very famous individual in the Sword of the Lord group. And so that's why we're actually uh, pressing these buttons here. We're trying to show you. Now, Brian Edwards used to be in the Sword of the Lord group, but he's gotten out of it. Tim, I'm not sure exactly what Tim is doing these days. And, and I don't. when I say not sure, I don't mean that I don't know what Tim is doing, where he is. We basically keep up with Tim Whitehart and the idea that, um, you know, he's not still around. There he is in 2013. Let's take a little listen to it. Ain't no Lucifer in Isaiah 14 to fall. That's the ba king of Babylon. and they, So he's going to be talking about Satan. He's still mixed up wherever he is, center point. He can't be at cross point, so he's at center point right here in 2013. And so we're basically saying tonight, this is the kind of information that you're going to get. Now, I want to just go ahead and, and get in. Let me see how big I made this. Here's Tim Whitehart's grandfather. Now, you know, people just, they get real tense with us when we start talking about things that create um, like sadness and hardship. And I get that. He has died. And you'll move that down a little bit, um, Daniel, please. He has died, and it's like, Johnny, don't you have any respect for people's feelings and whatnot? Listen, I do not have regard for people above what the Bible says. This broadcast is what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible say about Bobby Robertson? Sword of the Lord, Walker Town, uh, longtime pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walker Town. He passes. But before he passes, he is in Hammond, Indiana, in the middle of a huge controversy. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're basically trying to, to reel you in and help you to realize that you are being duped. You're constantly being duped. We're back to Sarcastic Man's book. This is chapter 6, and notice what it said, it's titled. Now it had, he's got some crazy titles, like Baptize Me in Campbell Soup, because he says we're followers of Alexander Campbell. Now look at this, AD 33 or 1827, which? So he's basically saying, if you're looking at this, the so-called Church of Christ, Christ taught to believe that their church originated on the day of Pentecost, their doctrine was embraced by the disciples and has been believed by true Christians ever since. Nothing further could be from the truth, or nothing could be further from the truth. I have read the life of Alexander Campbell. He says, Mr. Powell says, and then look what he says here. 
he says that uh, we teach, history reveals accurately where the church of Christ began, to believe what they teach would be to conclude that everybody went to hell before 1827. They ignore and despise the historical teaching as to their origin. The Church of Christ cult began in 1827 by Alexander Campbell. I am here to tell you that he just paid the greatest compliment you could possibly pay to any man that I have read historically. If in fact the Church of Christ did start in 1827 with Alexander Campbell, you are not going to believe the Baptist information that is put out in the Baptist manual, the standard man manual for Baptist churches, 18 1890 edition. Now, how many years would that be? 1827. We got some uh, smart folk here with us tonight. What's the math uh, between 1890 and, and 1827? Is that about 73 years or 63 years? 63 years. Okay. 63 years. This manual is 63 years later after supposedly Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ, according to Mr. Piles, Sword of the Lord, historian. So now I want to see if I can put this together for you. Let's see. Number 31. Let's see what happens. Here we are. We're at, with the standard manual for Baptist churches. You can have a copy of this. The reason I would want you to have a copy of it is is because what you'll actually find out is your great-grandparents don't do anything. This would be your great-grandparents. They were nothing like your parents. Like there used to be a commercial where they said, this is not, my, not your daddy's Oldsmobile. And what they were trying to do is get the younger crowd to buy an Oldsmobile because mostly old people had Oldsmobiles. My, I actually bought my daughter an Oldsmobile when she was in the, what, 10th grade? And one of her good friends uh, got in it, and he, and he said to Che, this is just like my grandma's car. And Che didn't like that car ever again. So this is not your daddy's Oldsmobile. Guess what? This is not your parents' Baptist church. This is your great, maybe even your great, great parent, grandparents' Baptist church. And they think, if they could talk to you right now, if you would read this, I'd be glad for you to have it. We just ordered probably a hundred more. I'd be glad for you to read it. You will hear these people basically sentence your parents to hell because they are nothing like Baptists in the 1890s. What's the point of bringing it up? Well, the point of bringing it up is, is they actually have a section in here that is the historical. Let's see, chapter 15, the last chapter, is actually Baptist history. So we turned to chapter 15, and, and that's what we want you to do, is we want you to hear from page 125, and look at this. In one, on page 125, Baptist history, notice what they end up talking about. They talk about a person named Dr. Featley. Now, if you remember watching our broadcast, if you're not a new watcher, you know I have this book. I have the book that Dr. Featley wrote, the 1644 version, and it's an old book. It's not a reprint. This is a very old book. One of the bitter enemies wrote them in 1633. He says, This sect, among others, has so far presumed upon the patience of the state that it hath held weekly conventicles, rebaptizing hundreds of men and women together in twilight, in rivulets, and in some arms of the Thames, the Thames, and elsewhere, dipping them all over head and ears. Now, What's going on here? 1633. That's what the Baptists are saying. They're telling you that Dr. Featley, Thomas Featley, who was a bitter enemy, they say, of Baptists. Now, basically, they're saying anybody who gets in the water, dipped head and ears, all the way dipping your head and ears, your entire body, all the way to your head and ears, those are Baptists. They're always Baptists. Well, the thing is, I have Dr. Featley's book, and I have the answer to Dr. Feely inside the book, and they call themselves Churches of Christ in that book. But nevertheless, let them have, let's let them have their way. They're saying that the Baptists have been around since 1633, and Dr. Feely was a bitter enemy. He actually was in the Parliament, and he is one of the translators of the King James 1611 Bible. That's how famous this guy is. He's also known as Thomas Faircloth, a pseudonym. Dr. Thomas Featley, parliamentarian. 
1633, he's debating with people that baptize. So let's give them that. Here's what we're doing. We're giving them that they've been around since 1633, even though there is no evidence, their books that they're quoting does not give evidence that they've been around for 1633, since 1633, but let's just go ahead and give it to them, just for argument's sake. So the Baptists have been around since 1633. They say the Church of Christ was started in 1827. Now, I'm going to have to have my phone now. We got to have the difference between 1633 and 1827. You doing it? Tell me how many years head start they had on us. 1633 to 1827. So they've got 194, by their own admission, 194 years start, jump, head start on the Church of Christ. Now remember, I don't believe this, but we're giving it to them just for 194 year head start on us. And then Alexander Campbell comes on, along on the scene in 1827 and they claim he started the Church of Christ. All right, so here's their book in the history, in the, back, the last chapter of their book, they actually give out some numbers for their churches. And so in that 1890, they claim after 194 years, that's, let's, what's the math on that? 1890, 1633 to 1890. We're going to go ahead and let them have their full out 1890. 257. 200? 257. 257 years. After 257 years, now you got to get this. After 257 years, they claim themselves to have 3 million members. Okay. 257 years of existence according to their own historical book. And they've got 257 years and they've got 3 million members. Well, guess what? they actually tally up the Church of Christ. From 1827, they actually have it right here on the next page, 1827 to 1890. What did we say that was? 60, we've got too many numbers here, 67? 63. 63 years. In 63 years, Alexander Campbell was able to teach 850,000 people. And in 250 years, these people can only come up with 3 million? Are you seeing that? How many? Let's just, let's see if we can do this math. How many times will 63 go into 257 to see how much longer they've been around? 257 divided by 63. That's a, that's going to be about, what, four times as long? They've been around four times longer? They've been around by their own admission. This is, this is where they start saying, we can find ourselves 1633. So they've been around four times longer than the Church of Christ. Now let's do one more. This is getting even more difficult. Let's, let's take three million and find out how many times 850,000 will go into three million. I can pretty much tell you. It will only go once. Is that not true? So these people have been around for 250 years and they can only come up with 3 million members and Alexander Campbell has only been around 63 years. The Church of Christ has only been around 63 years and j just in the United States alone, by the Baptist's own admission, they have 850,000 individuals. That's the most phenomenal, unbelievable compliment to Alexander Campbell that I believe I've ever heard anybody pay to anybody. It took them 250 years to get to 3 million and in 63 years this guy affected 850,000 individuals by the admission of the Baptists. How did he do it? Well according to um, Torbett who is an American Baptist historian they actually were taking full churches, uh, full Baptist churches, full Methodist churches and turning them all the way around into the Church of Christ by their own admission. Another one, Presbyterian named Davidson, he said that in 20 years, just 20 years alone, that would be when Alexander Campbell was first a young man, that they grew by 150,000 in 20 years. Man, if Davidson is right in his history, in that first 20 years, they, that's just in Kentucky, by the way. That's, isn't that right? He's, he's a Presbyterian historian just for Kentucky. 
150,000 individuals out of Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian came over to the Church of Christ that Alexander Campbell is supposedly have started. Now, let me just give me a minute here to just to breathe on this. What in the world was Alexander Campbell teaching? How in the world do you get all of these people to come out and follow a man? Now, remember, this is the guy who put us, gave us the date, 1827. Hugh Pyle, Sword of the Lord, great historian. Now, can, can I ask you just, just like, let's just think about this. Where are all these Sword of the Lord preachers? I mean, you would think that they would want to shut this business down. In 63 years, you actually come up with what it took them four times. It took 250 years of Baptists all over the world, and they can only come up with 3 million individuals. And here this guy starts in 1827, and he comes up with 850 converts, people like him going throughout the West and going down into Texas as far as however uh, uh, the United States spread out in 1827 and then into 1890. Man, that is phenomenal. What's up with y'all? Why couldn't y'all put a stop to that? All these powerful Baptists, y'all have pretty much by your own admission, you own everything. You claim everybody that gets in the water, head and shoulders and ears is a Baptist. And they, look at this, they uh, actually, if I hadn't uh, brought it up so high, so large, I could show you all the different kinds of people that are dunking. Now, they don't, ch they don't claim the dunkards and they don't claim... The anti-missionary, that's the primitive Baptist. You hear that? Anti-missionary, you primitive Baptist. Y'all don't care about anybody really reaching out because you're either saved or you're not saved from the beginning of time. You're elected. That's part of Calvinism. So they got all that in here. Now, what do you think? Is this not amazing from the standpoint of their own admission? Sarcastic man, thank you. You just demonstrated that the Church of Christ in 63 years... Do you know that we, they, they quote from the yearbook of Baptist churches in the, in the manual? According to the yearbook of all churches in America, in 1960, the Church of Christ was the fastest growing religion in the United States, 1960s. Now that's the yearbook of American churches has that quote. Now their book is the yearbook of the Baptist churches. Well, which one? That's not very impressive. You keeping up with yourself? The yearbook of, of American churches, that's keeping up with all the religious people and it wasn't the Church of Christ doing the counting. But I mean, you can see why. Some say that a quarter of the population were already members of the Church of Christ by the turn of the century, 1900. How in the world did they do it? Listen, folks, it's the same kind of truth that Paul, Peter, James, and John, the apostles and the men that worked with them were using. It convicts. It converts. It brings you out of these man-made religions and nobody ever called themselves a Campbellite. They always said that we just want to be Christians. What was it that Campbell taught? Campbell said, call Bible things by Bible names. Do Bible things in Bible ways. Let's return to the ancient order of things. Well, ain't no Baptist church in the ancient order of things. Did it work? Well, you ask yourself, did it work? Was it working? Now, you're going to have to go back on this video to do that math. There's as much math in this as in Louis Farrakhan's Me and Man March sermon. Serious math, but it's, it's, it really was simple. Um, I don't know how simple it is. I had an 11th grader actually here doing the math for me. Are you a math student? He is actually a math student, so I, I, my prayers were answered tonight. I appreciate uh, Can I call your name? Antoine being here with me and Caleb. And so... Folks, we're not done with the sword of the Lord. That's just unbelievable. You know, uh, honestly, oh, I'm usually not at a loss, really, for words. And I just really don't know how to go forward, honestly, because... The information that we have tonight is, it is so tremendously wrong that I'm just saying wrong in so many senses that it is really more than I feel like I can actually handle putting this out in front of you. The sword of the Lord is one of the most corrupt groups of individuals that they make 
the Catholic priest look like altar boys when it comes to sex. The sexual activity that's taking place inside the Sword of the Lord group, Bobby Robertson, Tim Whitehart, Jack Hiles. You never heard of Jack Hiles? You never heard of John Scott? Oh, well, John Scott is in prison right now. And Bobby Robertson definitely knows John Scott. There is no doubt about that. Jack Scott, there is no doubt about that. Because if I am able tonight to present this information to you, I will be demonstrating a cover-up that is so far beyond what you've been able to actually see. Like, you get to read news. You get to read, uh, let's just go ahead and say, you have had a chance to read about, what's the Catholic guy's name, Mark White? You've had a chance to read what Bill Wyatt says about Mark White. But you know what? Bill Wyatt is actually a sex person himself that is in the Baptist church. I mean, why is Bill Wyatt famous to you? Because Bill Wyatt was in the Washington, is it Post or Times? In the Washington Post back in the 1990s when I first moved to town, he made Sleepy Little Martinsville be a famous uh, place by his sexual escapades with Ramona Hines. Now, he today is reporting on sex scandals in the Catholic Church. But the thing is, I can't figure out why no one's doing a story on the Sword of the Lord crowd like Bobby Robertson, Tim Whitehart, and individuals that are involved in this awful scheme. Now, I need to put some things together for you. I'm about to play, let's move from Sleepy Martinsville to Hammond, Hammond, Indiana. Been through Hammond, Indiana many times, have we not, Lori? Right outside of big city Chicago. And chicagomagazine.com actually does the story on Jack Howell's church in Hammond, Indiana. First Baptist church. And I'll just go ahead and, and stay with my uh, timeline here. I want to introduce you to the First Baptist Church longtime lawyer, David Gibbs, who declined a request to comment on the story. What story? The story on the pastor who is now in prison for taking young girl across the state line, and you know the rest, but that was just one of his escapades. It was just like a constant barrage, and then they just started finding out that these pastors that came from this school just fanned out all over the United States, and they have been moved around and managed, and you say, well, what are you talking about, Johnny? Moved around and managed. Did you not see how they moved around and managed Tim Whitehart? I have a video on my computer where Tim and I were supposed to meet a particular day, I believe it was 2005, on a January or February cold day, and there was ice everywhere, and myself and one of the uh, individuals that's been a longtime helper of this work and in the Pacific, an uh, individual named Guy Dickinson, we went ahead and braved the ice and went on over to Freedom Baptist Church and we went in and we asked the secretary, where's Tim? They said, nobody knows where Tim is. I guess Tim had forgotten that we were supposed to have a Bible study with him that day. And come to find out, Tim was off on an escapade that ended up being almost two-year escapade with one of the women in the congregation. And the thing is, if you remember the story, Tim was whisked off. Now, Tim told everybody that he was going, he'd been called to the mission field. Well, let me ask you this. How do you manage to actually be involved with another woman for two years and then get to get called off into the mission field starting in Florida, Pensacola? How do you manage such a thing? It's called cover-up. And when you've got a big organization like Sword of the Lord and you've got a grandpa that actually appeared on the Sword of the Lord 2012 um, lectures. Now, this actually says preaches Wednesday at Pastor School 2011. At, so that's, that's right. He, he appears in Hammond, Indiana in 2011 at one of the biggest mega churches the Independent Fundamental Baptists have and Jack 
uh, Hiles was at the helm at one time and then it ended up being his son-in-law that we're going to look in a minute. How in the world do you get whisk into Pensacola and that's it, two years fooling around and you can get called to the mission field and no reprisal? Well, you lost your big church, but still, seriously, that's it? And then, I can't remember what year it was, but uh, it wasn't that long ago, six, eight years ago, something like that, Tim Whitehart appears again. It was while uh, Mike Rogers was still uh, the chief of police. I do remember that. Tim appears again right here in Martinsville, and they rent out the Martinsville High School. Oh, how do you get to do all that? I mean, it's this big, powerful organization called Sword of the Lord, and these Baptist folk that had been around since 1633 and managed to get themselves 3 million members in 250 years. And why is Tim Whitehart not here now? With all of this power behind the push, you know, his grandfather being in one of uh, a, a noted speaker, a person that's called in to Hammond, Indiana to speak at one of the biggest independent fundamental Baptist churches in the nation. How come he's not here now? Well, it's because we're the kind of people like Alexander Campbell. We don't follow Alexander Campbell, but we recognize the power that's in the Bible. And Alexander Campbell was basically helping individuals to turn whole churches and the number counted by the Baptists, why the Baptists count in the Church of Christ, please tell me. You ever stop and think about that? Why all of this, this uh, attention, and it's almost like a complex about the Church of Christ. I don't hear y'all hitting on, well, I actually do. I actually have a couple of books with me tonight where the Baptists actually say why and why not. And one of their big Sunday school uh, board uh, uh, head of Sunday school board back in the 1800s or 19, early 1906, he writes a book and he basically tells you why he's not a Methodist, why he's not a Presbyterian. They did focus on those individuals, but you know, those people are not really that much of a threat. And so probably we'll get into that maybe towards the end. We may not have time, but I'm saying, why is Tim Whitehart not here? Because every time he shows back up, guess what happens? We actually move the sword of the Lord curtain and we peer back in behind and we show you what's going on. But you know what? Tonight, can we say the curtain, curtain call? Now, how about I say it like this? This could be the final curtain call for one of us. It could be the final curtain call for me. Or it could be the final curtain call for Tim Whitehart. And many of these very wicked, unbelievably obscene Baptists in the sword of the Lord group. Now, you, you're asking, you're asking, why would it be the final curtain call for you, Johnny? It's because the people that I am involved with in the Church of Christ today, they don't have the stomach for things that were done in the 1800s, like when Alexander Campbell was around, and you saw, according to the Baptists, the number go from zero to 850,000 converts in 63 years. They don't have the stomach for that kind of controversy. As a matter of fact, you bring my name up, and most of these little wimpy preachers, they say, oh no, we had, to, we had some folks from Withful, Virginia drive three hours to be with us, and they asked me, uh, what's that boy's name? In Wesley School, the one that has a relatives right here in this area, and uh, he's over in Boone or somewhere. Yeah. So this gentleman from Withville, he has uh, in his local area. There's a preacher named Canut. Now I don't know this particular Canut, but I know that he's related to the one that I do know. And he asked him, he said, do you know Johnny Robertson? Oh, he is too controversial. Really? That's all? That's the only problem you have with me is that I'm controversial? Davidson in his Presbyterian history about uh, the Presbyterian Church in Kentucky, when he gets to Alexander Campbell, you know what he actually says? He says that in 20 years, they taught in Kentucky 150,000 individuals. And he said, Alexander Campbell's forte was controversy. Guess what Jesus' forte was? 
Well, he ended up on the cross after only preaching for three years, so you tell me. Was he trying to win friends and influence people? Not the way Dale Carnegie was. You see, Jesus had a totally different style, and we're actually using the exact same style. We know that what we do is going to raise the roof, bring the curtain down. And the question is, do you not realize that we realize it? You might say, well, Johnny, listen, your dog and pony show, you're, you're fixing to create the closing act. And what if we did create the closing act, at least in your mind, like there's no way you can show this kind of stuff and end up being accepted while your own people will turn on you. Listen, I don't have any own people. I'm not Jesus. I didn't purchase the church, and neither did I bleed for it. I, am, I belong to Jesus. Component show, it belongs to him. And if it's time for it to catch fire and you catch on your, a blaze from it, a spark from it, and set you on fire for the Lord, then so be it. What in the world could you possibly be talking about? Okay, here we go. And then I just kept looking and I got a glimpse of David Gibbs. God bless you, brother. Okay, right out of Tim Whitehart's grandpa's mouth. He's at Hammond, Indiana. He's at Wednesday at Pastor School 2011. And bless David Gibbs' heart. He gets a view of him in the audience. God bless you, David Gibbs. Who's David Gibbs? David Gibbs is the first Baptist church's longtime lawyer that's been keeping these pedophiles out of jail. Well, will he talk to anybody at the Chicago Magazine? Declined a request for comment on this story. Spokesman for the church, Eddie Wilson, did not return numerous calls, requested an interview. Scop, that is his name, S-C-H-A-A-P, it's pronounced Scop, did not respond to an interview request made through Porter County Jail. So Scop is in jail just like six or eight months later. We're talking 2011, and they're doing this story in 2012. Let's see what we have in the Chicago Magazine. A string of assaults and sexual crimes committed by pastors across the country have one thing in common. The perpetrators have ties to the mega church in Hammond, Indiana. Are you ready? A string of assaults and sexual crimes committed by pastors. Now, Tim Whitehart is not, has not committed a crime as the law would say, but it's a group of pastors that stretched across the country have one thing in common. What is that? Ties to Hammond, Indiana. Is he tied to Hammond, Indiana? Where's Grandpa? He's in Hammond, Indiana. And bless my soul, he is praising David Gibbs, the lawyer that's keeping all these sex criminals out of jail. But now they're on the front page of a Chicago magazine. Look at him here. Here's Jack right here in the middle. He's in the middle, in the middle. He's in the middle one row down. He's in the middle when you move over either way. That's him right there. Now, what's up with that? Nine of the fenders from top to left. A.V. Bollinger, Christopher Settlemore, Meyer, Chester Mulligan. Second row, William don't know how he pronounces his, la his last name. I don't think he probably cares if I get it right or wrong if he's in prison. Jack Scott, Ted Butler, Joseph Combs, Craig Sisson, and Russell Ovala. All of these individuals on the front page, and they're involved in a huge scandal. Just, it really is too much. It's beyond the imagination. So, now we have everything together. We have Bobby Robertson. Is Bobby Robertson big enough to cover up his grandson's discretions here in this area and actually keep him in the pulpit? Yes, the Sword of the Lord organization has been able to do that for years. So we've got the scene set. Now, I've got to basically bring this along, and you might be saying, you know, I don't know what you think about my nerve. I do not have a tremendous nerve. You know how people say, you've got a lot of nerve. I don't. I'm trying to figure out a way out of this because I've already gotten myself into it and it needs to be brought out and I know I've got your attention 
And I'm trying to figure out just how far, how long can we last? Because I know that you thought that we were at the end a long time ago. So, Bobby Robertson, Tim Whitehart's granddad. I'll tell you what you could do. You could call Brian Edwards up. If you're watching tonight, now I wouldn't dare do that because Brian actually sued the station once for that kind of thing. But I tell you what I can do. I can actually give you Brian Edwards' number. You remember what day it was I told you that I talked to Brian? No. Was it last week? It would have been this week. It would have been this past week that we're in. There it is right there. Okay, here's what I will do. I will give you a cell phone number. Here it is. You got your pen out? 434-770-3432. Now, one more time, 434-770-3432. Brian was Tim's best friend. You can get Brian to call in and tell us how it is that the sword of the Lord has this kind of power and then you could ask him. He probably wouldn't want to call in. That's fine. I wouldn't want to call into this either. But you could call him and ask him if all of this really did happen. If he knows who Jack Hiles is and Jack Scott, if he knows who Bobby Robertson is, and is it the fact that Jack Scott is in prison, and is it the fact that sort of the Lord has the power to cover this kind of stuff up, and how it is that his good friend Tim could actually be involved with a woman for two, two years in the biggest church in Martinsville, and, and end up putting out a rumor that he was called into the mission field and then it turned out to be a lie and he's still afloat. And then back to Martinsville, tried to start all over again and I don't know if he's really here or not. You still have rumors that he's still around working. Last I heard, I heard he was working in hospice. I don't know. How, does, how is this possible? Well, I tell you, I don't have Bill White's number, but you could call Bill White up and ask how it is that he was able to manage to stay afloat and be a Baptist preacher. I know he's, he said in the past uh, that he was a Baptist preacher and he got on and he explained all the wherefores and whereofs of marriage, divorce, and remarriage and how, could he, actually, how he could actually commit fornication and then be eligible to be married again today. And so... That's kind of where we are, and uh, if Charles was here, he could probably give us Bill White's number. You don't have, happen to have it, do you, Daniel? All right, let's have it. Let me give him a tip right now. That's what a good reporter does, doesn't he? All right, I'm listening. Well, you call it out, Caleb. Yeah, he's been calling out. All right, let's... 276. 276-632-9094. All right. Nothing wrong with this. He wants to interview. He says he's been trying to get in touch with me. He wants to interview. Here's the number, Bill White. 276-632-9094. Now, you can ask these individuals who are covering sex scandals that have been in sex scandals that are in the Baptist church. How do you get in, how do you be involved in something like that and then you end up being this noted individual still in town? How do you be over at Hammond, Indiana six, eight months before the big preacher gets put in prison and you actually praise the lawyer that's keeping the pedophiles out of prison and it doesn't follow you back to Walkertown? In case you don't know where Walkertown is, Madison Mayadan, just right down the road, Winston-Salem, just this side of Winston-Salem. How in the world does all that work? Well, while you're thinking about it, did this help Sarcastic Man at all, or was this the best gift that he could have brought out? I'm so glad Sarcastic Man was able to tell Charles about this book that basically makes them look foolish, ineffective, toothless. Took 250 years to arrange three million individuals into the Baptist faith. Well, there's no wonder. There's no Baptist faith in this book. It's a wonder they could manage that, but it took 250 years to do it. But in 63 years, Alexander Campbell takes the Bible and he basically talks Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, the whole bunch, 850,000 of them in 63 years. 
the Baptists themselves were doing the counting. So we know it's right. If the Baptists are counting, man, they are on the ball, aren't they? So here we go. Well, what actually was happening? All right. Now we're going to move to Jim, B-I-N-N-E-Y. Now, I want us to, you got to help me. I'm saying in the audience, you got to help me here because, you know, I'm doing the sweating. Now, you might be thinking, this guy's doing the sweating, but I'm doing the sweating, and I'm trying to figure out this guy right here. Here he is, Jack, let's call his name B-I-N-N-E-Y. How would you say that? Biney? I don't think it's Benny. So Jack Biney. Now, my question is, Jack Biney is going to admit to something really bad. And during the, the what he admits to, he was up in here. And so I can't figure out exactly which one he is when he was confessing. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to all let's all take a mental picture of Jack. Here he is. This is got a lot of Jacks in here. Jack Hiles is the one who established the school. Jack Scop is his son-in-law, and he's in prison for uh, taking a 16-year-old girl across state lines, and they weren't buying guns. So we got to do a little mental. You take yourself a little mental image here, Jack. Biney. Now, I'm fixing to show you Jack Scop. Now, I got the volume down. I, I told you this is not a children's show. So, I need for you to take a mental, get this mental picture, and you tell me. You can literally call me because I haven't figured it out yet because I've been sweating to the degree that I can't quite seem to pay attention. The sermon has me electrified, uh, petrified, and I can't find Jack, but I know he's up in here because he admits to it. Okay, here we go. Jack Scott. Now, is that Jack right behind Jack? There's a guy right here. He's the only one that even looks remotely, but we, in order to see this, y'all, we have to continue on with this X-rated, triple X-rated sermon by Jack Scott. You know, is this him? Okay, that's 34 seconds. Let's go back to see if we can find. Now, it's a bald-headed man. And let's hear what he says about what he was involved in. Now, can I say this? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say some things tonight. And I, I told the Lord, I'll, I'll do it, Lord. I don't want to. I don't want to become your enemy because I tell you the truth. I like to be liked. I'm a nice person. Oh, you're not a nice person. I know that you were involved in this and you didn't do anything. You sat either behind Jack and watched it or you were on the front row somewhere where you had the ability to stop it and you didn't. But now you're basically one of the sword of the Lord folk and you're in the cover-up mode. I want to be a nice person. He, who's he imitating? Some, I don't know. Who? Tweety Bird. Tweety Bird, that's right. He's... Uh, he is afraid Sylvester's fixing to chew him up. Now listen, y'all, I never get to be a nice person. I'm always basically the hateful guy, the individual that you can't stand. And why? It's because we're uncovering sword of the Lord misbehavior, and we're trying to point out to you that, listen, you're being hoodwinked. This group of individuals, by their own admission, that it took them 250 years to gather together, together 3 million people that could be hoodwinked into believing that there's a, such a thing as a Baptist church in this book, when you can read and you know there's no Baptist church, but you're going to buy into it anyway. And then this guy, Jack, Jack uh, Hugh Piles, he tells you 
that Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ. Well, let's, can, we, can we just dispense with that real quick? This is really, this is why um, this right here, I'm going to have to go out just a second. This is why Alexander Campbell and individuals like him could in fact get to the point that we're talking about in 63 years. 853,000 people convert in 63 years. Why? Because, you know what, it's really not that hard, Joe Prater, to convince people that you need to be a member of the Church of Christ when you can actually read it right here in the Bible. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, if you could have a passage that said Baptist churches, then you would be on the winning team. You could actually be with a group of people that can muster a growth rate of 850 individuals out of denominations into the Church of Christ in 63 years instead of be with a group of people that can't even find themselves in the Bible and have to lie about their existence in England in 1633. Remember, I told you, I've got Dr. Featley's book. There ain't no Baptist church in Dr. Featley's book. It, it says there were seven churches of Christ in London that was being hated on by Thomas Featley. So you see what, so what we're saying here? Now, that's how all of this happens, how it is that these individuals, now you might say, well, you know, Johnny, before you came along, we never heard of the Church of Christ, and we don't hear too much about the Church of Christ. Really, when you get down to it, too much in the United States. They, we don't really know any of their programs. I, I wouldn't guess that you would because their programs are very dumbed down. They don't tell you things about your denominational neighbors. Well, you might say, well, why would you want to talk about your neighbors? Listen, if your neighbor's having sex with a 16-year-old and he's the pastor, you need to know about it. Well, I don't think our pastor is. Well, how do you know? Is he involved with the sword of the Lord? Has he come out against this? Did Bobby Robertson come out against it? Did Bobby Robertson come out publicly against Tim Whitehart? No. Did, did Brian Edwards come out publicly against Tim Whitehart? Not that I know of. He was still defending him way back there when I was having discussions with Brian. And so I know that I talked to Craig. What's up? Okay, Three Stooges, Three Stooges. that's right. I, I, okay. <laughs> okay, you got one of the Baptists actually acting like one of the Three Stooges. Let's back up just a little bit and hear it again. Lord, I'll, I'll do it, Lord. I don't want to. I don't want to become your enemy because I tell you the truth. I like to be liked. I'm a nice person. <laughs> but i, I got to ask the question, what kind of loyalty is this? What kind of loyalty is this? I want you to think about that word loyalty because I made a special, a special effort today look all through the Bible. And you know, I could not find one mention of the word loyalty. Now, loyalty is an important thing, but is it a biblical virtue? Is, is it a spiritual gift? Is it a godly command? The Lord sent Nathan to confront the king. To wag his finger in his face. Sometimes I wonder, where were the wagging fingers? Can I make a confession? When I came here over a year ago, when I moved here over a year ago, I immediately knew in my spirit that something was wrong. But I made a covenant with the Lord and myself. I mean, I, I, say, I remember one time I corrected Pastor Scott on, on a sermon. Uh, it was uh, a quiet reception, not unkind. But I, I, I began to think, you know, I'm the new kid on the block. I, I don't have any right to, to go to Pastor Scott. If I, if I hear something that I think is a little off base biblically, if I, if I sense something that's wrong, I am going to earn the right, I said to myself, uh, by waiting one year before I say anything. You know, that year was just up. And I have to wonder if I'd been a Nathan. And I have to wonder, why didn't I say anything? Why didn't you? Why didn't the staff? And, and, and I'm not saying they didn't say anything. 
But, but did any of us know to do good and not do it? Did it, did it or, or were we afraid of the king? Now you ask yourself, where was Bobby Robertson? Just kept looking and I got a glimpse of David Gibbs. God bless you, Brother David. Where was David Gibbs? Where was he after the king fell? I mean, we've got the whole sordid story played out in Chicago Magazine. First Baptist Church, longtime lawyer, blessed of Bobby Robertson from his own lips, not even a year before. God bless David Gibbs, declined to a request for comment on the story. Been harboring these guys for years. And Jack Biney, he says, where were you? I, I knew something was wrong. Don't you love it? when you have a guy that comes along and he's the one guy who says that he knew something was going on, but he didn't do anything. And you know what, folks? I can tell you something's going on too. And I'm not going to be a person who doesn't do anything. That's not, that's not how the, the dog and pony show ends with us. We're going to be the people that were doing our best to try to tell you that this sort of the Lord crowd, they are about like sarcastic man. They're up under the bleachers. They're the individuals that are not going to tell you the truth. They're the individuals that are going to hide their ungodly preachers, sex scandals, things of that nature. They did it, said it by their own admission. That was about as high up as you get when you really get down to it. So you ask yourself a question. Who is really helping whom in this area? What does the Bible say? Members of the Church of Christ, are we the ones that are actually telling you the truth, showing you what does the Bible say, helping you to realize which church you should be a member of? We're in that group. I do have high regard for Alexander Campbell. I don't follow Alexander Campbell, but anybody that can create that much groundswell in 63 years where the Baptists actually are counting they're the ones doing the counting for us. 850 converts in 63 years took them 250 years to get 3 million folk together. And they're not even all together either. They're all kinds of different kind of Baptists. So you ask yourself tonight, why do you watch What Does the Bible Say? Because we bring you what the Bible says and we bring you the truth about what's going on in town. God bless you. Always ask for What Does the Bible Say? Good night. What's happening 